So Genesis chapter 5. Now, remember at the end of chapter 4, it gave us Cain's genealogy. And uh, Cain, though, would be rejected to be a part of the line of the Messiah. So in chapter 5, we now have a brand new genealogy and uh, looking to Seth. It told us that at the end of chapter 4. But now we begin chapter 5. And uh, it says there, this is the book or the writings of the genealogy of Adam. This is the first time this word is used here. And the only way to understand it is that this was literally, he's reading what Adam had written. So Adam, you know, whether they did it on a papyrus or however they did it, I don't know. But they, they had this genealogy of the kids. In what order? And Adam was keeping track of it. And in the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. So he's going all the way back to creation now. And he created them, male and female, and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. So when we look at this here, we, we say, wow, you know, what, what's the, the focus? The word created is three times in these two verses. It's almost as if Adam is looking into the future and saying, not evolution. <laughs> He's saying, I was created. And I was created, and he makes it clear, in God's image. And we were male and female, not three, four, five, six, seven other things. And the two make up mankind, period. So it's it's leaves really out a lot of other theories, like the theory of evolution. He didn't say here, and God created, and after a few million years, I quit, you know, my great-great-grandfather quit dragging his knuckles on the ground, and I am the first generation who stood upright, and after I stood upright, after millions of years or billions of years of evolution, um, I realize, hey, now I'm in God's image. It, does, it, makes, it makes it clear. It's created three times in the past tense. It was clearly done. And in the moment he, it was done, that creation happened. In that moment, he was in God's image. And then he made the female. And together, the two of them make up mankind. And so what do we see here? We, we see a book, as we're going to see, given the exact age when they had their kids, the exact age when they died. Um, it's not generally saying, oh, 700-ish years. No, 912 years. I mean, they, they tell you specifically. So the idea that, well, here's how you need to read Genesis Generically, there's Adams. Generically, there's Eves. This is what God wants you to know. There wasn't a literal one Adam, a literal Eve. I mean, it's giving us an idea of what was sort of generally in existence. And from the group of Adams and the groups of Eves came mankind. This is what they try to say. Then they'll, right after that, we get to chapter six, they'll tell you there wasn't a worldwide flood either. <laughs> And you keep going down and they keep telling you, yeah, you, they didn't really cross the Red Sea either. And they, it, it just never stops. But let's look here. This chapter five is not a spiritual writing. It's a historic document. The reason that's important because when we're studying the Bible, we are studying a book of history, and that's the way it's be, to be interpreted. Okay, when you read a newspaper, there's all different types of literature in that one newspaper, right? If you're reading something that is history from yesterday, and they're telling you about it, then you could have uh, the comic strip, <laughs> then you could have poetry, you could have 
you've you got to sort of have knowledge ahead of time if you're reading the, the Wall Street Journal section, you know, on the, on the stocks and so forth. You, in order to understand it, you've got to know what the different letters mean and, and the different graphs, or it won't make any sense. So, again here, th this is not trying to be a spiritual book. He's just saying, hey, this is the facts. There was Adam, he was created by God, and then Eve was made, and she was the female, and these two together, God blessed them, and he, he called them mankind, and, and this is, this is the, the way it happened. And now we're looking again at more historical information in verse 3. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days of Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. So he's making it clear here. I am not giving you an exhaustive genealogy of all the sons and the daughters of Adam and Eve. We, we see here that he had 130 years and he's still having kids. We're going to see Noah in a minute. He was, they were in their 500 years old having kids. So times were different at this time before the flood. If you take off the, the shortest guy who lived here, it was Enoch. He didn't die. He went to be with God. The oldest guy was Methuselah in chapter 5. He's the oldest, 969 years. You take those two away and you ask yourself, what's the average age of man at this time in history? It comes to an average of 912 years. Wow. That's a lot of Monday mornings to get up and go to work. Um. Things were different. You know, why were they different? I think the flood changed everything. Um, I, I'm not going to go into detail on that, but it, it tells us, and we'll see it next week, there was a, a canopy of water from above. So now we have this little tiny flimsy ozone layer. It gets holes in it, and, and it's not doing a very good job. And those cancerous rays uh, and aging rays coming from the sun, are no doubt making our life very short uh, on this earth. But part of it, too, is because before the flood, when people were living 900 plus years old, uh, man got corrupt, right? I mean, I, I, I've seen it my whole life in the church. People who just have such a love for God in their 20s and their 30s and their 40s, and they get in their 50s, and their kids are gone, and these, these people just become the most crusty Christians dragging their feet in their 50s and 60s and pretty much checked out by their, mid, their early 60s and mid-60s. They're checked out in 70s, 80s. They haven't been in church in decades, and, and they don't have a heart for God anymore. And then you see the few that do keep a fresh heart for God in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and man, how wonderful they are to have in the church. To have a 70-year-old teaching Sunday school, how rich. Or to leading a Bible study or doing the marriage group or just to get to know somebody who's been walking with the Lord for 50-plus years. Boy, what a treasure they are, especially to the young people. But again, um, if you get live much more than that, it seems like uh, a heart that once was good in the Lord after you've lived three, four, five, six, seven hundred years, um, it's, it's just hard to, to, to maintain that walk with God. And that's sort of the lesson we, we learn from this. Now, some say, well, if you have Adam and Eve and then all their kids, well, where did Cain and Abel and so forth get their spouse? It's very simple, guys. It was their sister or their first cousin, one of the two. At this time in history, again, before the flood, mutations were not an issue. We're going to see 13 generations uh, in the future. You know, we're talking the time of Abraham and stuff, and he was still married to his sister, his half-sister, but it wasn't a big deal. But then we get to the law of Moses, 
And he says, no more of that. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, and God says in the law not to do that. But again, it's not necessarily because there's some spiritual sin happening. It's just because the law gives us good um, health things to do and not to do. For example, God said, now when you guys go to war and you go number two, you dig a hole and you bury it because God is holy and he walks amongst you. Well, we know the real reason. It wasn't because of something spiritual. <laughs> it was because of uh, disease that can happen when you got hundreds of thousand guys leaving their poop everywhere. So again, sometimes the laws are, are just for good health reasons, but uh, it's way before man would understand it, um, bacteria and microscopes and all of that. And so um, we have a couple of, of things happening that are, that are unique. Wow, people are living up to be 900 years old. So Adam here, he no doubt had many other sons and daughters. And so, you know, specifically he mentions Abel and Cain. And now specifically Cain, it seems like maybe there was a holdout that Cain might have a, a change of heart or something. That's the way it looks in chapter four because it's given us Cain's lineage. And then it's just sort of like, forget Cain, Seth. And that's the way chapter four ends. And so it seems like, yeah, Cain's not gonna be redeemed to be a part of the line of the, the Messiah. So it's, he's non, non important anymore with his genealogy. So now we're going back to Seth. And, and it tells in verse four that he begot Seth in the days of Adam were 800 years and he had sons and daughters. So many others that uh, are not being mentioned and all the days of Adam lived were 930 years and he died. So we're going to see in this chapter, nine times it mentions he had sons and daughters. Each of these guys had many sons and daughters not mentioned in the geology. We're just simply looking at the lineage to the Messiah. We'll discover later, but we know that now because we have the end of the book and we've read it. Um, what's really going on here is the lineage to the Messiah. And so they all had many sons and daughters not mentioned here, historically letting you know that this is not inaccurate it's just not complete on purpose. And, and he died. Eight times it'll say that. And he died. And he died. And he died. So Adam and Eve, in the day you eat of that, you're going to die. And death came into the world. So in verse 6 now, So Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. And after he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and he had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan. And after he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. And Canaan lived 70 years and begot Melhalel, and he begot Mahalel, and Canaan lived 840 years, and he had sons and daughters, and all the sons of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. Now, verse 15. Mahalel lived 65 years, and he begot Jared. And after he begot Jared, Mahalel lived 830 years and had sons and daughters. And all the days of Mahalel were 895 years, and he died. And Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. Now, that's where it starts getting exciting here. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died, expectedly. Now, Enoch lived 65 years, and he begot Methuselah. So this is now we need to stop and, and focus on this. Um, this guy Enoch was the son of Jared. And um, after 65 years old, he has a child. Now, after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. 
So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Here's the one instance. It doesn't say he died. It says that the Lord took him. So this guy, Enoch, he has a child at 65 years old, which was young in those days. And he names him this rather unique name. Methuselah. We never see it repeated in the Bible, okay? There's a lot of the names in these two genealogies that we will see later in the Bible repeated many, many different times. A matter of fact, when you look at the lineage of Cain in chapter 4 and look at the lineage of uh, Adam to, to, through Seth in chapter 5, there's many names that are similar, and it gets a little, communi- little, uh, a little confusing because like, oh, Lemek. Oh, no, no, that's a chapter 4 Lemek, um, you know? And uh, there's other names like Mehalel that sounds very similar to other names. That's not the same name that's in chapter 4. But all of a sudden, you have this very unique storm, this very unique name. I, I had a friend in high school. His name was Storm. And uh, I asked his mom, why'd you name him Storm? Because the night uh, I was to give birth, there was a horrible storm, and all the roads were flooded, and the trees fell down, and I barely made it to the hospital and uh, the lights were flickering, and they were trying to keep the power on in the hospital. It was, and uh, so I named him Storm. But I've only had one friend named Storm. And so I, 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 in this case, it's like, hey, something unusual is happening here. And Enoch had this um, radical experience with God after his child was born. And he lived another 300 years after that child was born, had other kids. But I don't think he saw it coming and nobody around him saw it coming, but he was not. He just was vanished. And they knew he vanished because the Lord uniquely took him. Wow, this guy Enoch did not die. Man, God's interesting, isn't he? God's unique. God can do whatever he wants. It's his bat. It's his ball. It's his field. He invented the game. He can do whatever he wants, when he wants, how he wants. He's God. But obviously, in the midst of this rather boring genealogy, as they can sometimes be, all of a sudden, we're surprised by something happening here. You know, when you think about walking with God, there's, there's several things the Bible talks about walking with God. In Amos 3.3, 3, it says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? You've got to be in the same spirit as the other person to really enjoy being with them. Huh? I mean, when we say walking with God, we're really talking about fellowshipping and being having a rich fellowship. And uh, it's nice being with people on the exact same page. In Calvary's, we have that because Chuck's taught the word and every possible issue that comes up it was brought up and, and we're on the same page. We have sweet fellowship. Sometimes I get with other pastors that are more liberal, like from the Methodist or Episcopal Church or something, or, or, or you know, Calvinist or fundamentalist or, or sort of, over, uh, you know, King James Bible only type people. And, and, and uh, I, I, we agree with 99% on both sides, but yet there's just not that sweet fellowship because there's just not a complete agreement. But God bless the person who just says, God, I see things the way you see things, the way your word has revealed it. I think a humble heart's an essential. In Micah 6, 8, he has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. And then in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight, a walk of faith. He was in agreement with God. He had a humble heart. He was walking in faith. And then the last thing we see is walking in the light. And 1 John 1, 5 through 7, you know this well. This is the message that we've heard from him, declare to you that God is light and in him 
There is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So struggling with this human flesh and this sinful world is not an issue when we are coming to say, God, I, my goal is to walk in the light as you are in the light. The Bible tells us that sweet fellowship John talks about in the first four verses of that chapter one, that which we've seen and our hands have handled and we've touched concerning the word of life, the fellowship we have with Jesus, you can have the exact fellowship because it's in the spirit. And the fellowship we have with Jesus on earth, that was okay, but what we have right now through the spirit is far greater. And you can be in that same exact fellowship. Well, it's interesting that we, we have this story that's hardly a story, is it? It's just a couple of words out of this chapter five. You know, Enoch had a son, he walked with God, and he was not, because the Lord took him. It's like, okay, that's, that's the whole story. It's, it's barely even a sentence. It makes me think how many stories God didn't put in the Bible you know, we see that in the Gospel of John where John says, man, if we tried to tell you everything Jesus said and did, the volumes of the books on planet Earth would not be enough. We'd cut down every tree, we'd make a page out of every, and it still wouldn't be enough. Well, if that's true for 33 years of Jesus' ministry, how much more 6,000 years of human history? There must be some amazing stories like this that God says, as wonderful, as credible as the story this is, you're going to have to wait until there's story time in heaven uh, to hear some of these great stories. So we have this little thing. And, and then we get a couple of verses in the New Testament that really shine light on, on this guy Enoch. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5 and 6. You can turn there if you'd like or just listen. Hebrews 11, verse 5 and 6. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. And then this is the addition. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now we know from Genesis 5, he walked with God, but now it says that he pleased God. And then verse 6, he sort of expounds on that. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we learn really quick, what, what did it mean that he pleased God? He says he had faith. Now, how was that faith demonstrated? In doing miracles? Calling fire out of heaven? Being a great orator? No, his faith was incredibly revealed by his prayer life. Wow. This guy Enoch, he walked with God, which means fellowship with God. He was a man constantly crying out to God in the midst of a generation, guys, was before Noah before the flood, before everybody would die. It was a wicked generation he lived in. And at 65 years old in this very vile millennium of time, he has a son. And it's not just a boy, it's something God's doing something. He's, he's putting on my heart to name him strange. This, this weird name. Methuselah. And he just went from being nonchalant about God or maybe not obeying God and like all the other Adam and Eve's children, just sort of disconnected from God and even worse, not just not disconnected with God, really living life in a, their own way, which eventually was wicked. Well, we have one more verse here in Jude chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Now, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied. What do we learn about Enoch? He was a prophet. 
He was walking in fellowship with God. He, was, he had great faith. It was revealed in a great prayer life. And these men also saying, Behold, the Lord comes within thousand of his saints. Wow. Guys, that, that, there in Jude 1, verse 14, that is a prophecy we really don't understand until Revelation 19. In 1 Thessalonians 3, Paul says, hey, all of us will return with Christ. And then in Revelation 19, he's, we see us mounting on our horses, coming with the Lord out of heaven. And what does he do when he comes in Revelation 19? We stop at the Mount of Olives and stay there, but he goes down into Armageddon and fights against all the rebellious kings and all the rebellious people of the world and slays them all in judgment. Listen to Jude 1 verse 15. Not only did he say, hey, the Lord's coming with 10,000s of his saints, talking about the, the rapture, or talking about the second return of Christ, but he also says to execute judgment on all. This is what happens in Revelation 19. To convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Wow. From the very beginning, a guy that was alive while Adam was still alive was watching the putridness of man. And as he's praying, God gave him revelations as a prophet all the way up to the very end of the tribulation period. The entire history of man. And what was going on in that fellowship, I don't know. But it was deep. And finally, as he was just seeking the Lord, he was too holy for this world. And God said, just step right in to heaven with me. And there was no moment of death before that happened. You know, I, I, I wonder sometimes. You know, my good friend Ray Bentley just died the, from COVID just a couple of weeks ago. First guy to ever hire me as a pastor. He was three years older than me. He's 64. And he dies. Now we know the Lord had said, well done, good and faithful servant. <laughs> Come on home. But he had a heart attack and died. But that didn't happen with Enoch. God wanted Everybody to say what I'm doing, what I'm speaking through Enoch and through his son and what happened when he was 65 and that next 300 years as he walked with God and cried out in prayer and God began to make him a prophet and give him prophecies that nobody could even understand until us in the very last part of the New Testament, 2,000 years after the resurrection of the Messiah, God revealed it to him. So you think, man, all the things in between God revealed. And God finally just said, you're, you're too holy for this earth. <laughs> you're too near to me. And, and you're, in essence, too heavenly to have any earthly good. And I, I don't want to make a commotion with some heart attack or anything. Just come on home. And you got to understand, 365 years old, that's a poor little child in these days. Right? I mean, it's like, whoa, 300. Can you believe he died so young? Because everybody else is living three times that, right? Well, finishing up here. And so verse 25 to 27. So Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. Now, Lamech was a wicked guy in chapter four, so don't confuse him. And after he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. So he won. He's the oldest man who ever lived. Now there was, we're going to find out here that Noah lived 950 years. As we get to chapter 6, we're going to say, but nobody makes a big deal about that. That was pretty doggone close. 
Adam made it to 930. That was pretty close. So he was 969 years, but it really wasn't that extreme for the day. I mean, it was extreme. Don't get me wrong. Almost lived a 1,000 years. But his name is interesting. It says something to the essence, when he dies, it shall be sent, or in his death, it will come. And it was understood, judgment. Now we're going to see later on, and if you do the math, the year that Methuselah turns 969 years and dies is the same time as the flood. So whether he died of the same day as the flood or he died in the flood, we don't know. We assume he was a righteous guy, but not necessarily. And so, is this what happened? Where Enoch had this child and the Lord said, I've called you to be a man of God and, and you're a prophet to my people and, and this son, when he dies, destruction, judgment of God's going to come on the whole earth. The time is, the clock is ticking. And he looks at this baby and he sees the judgment of God. It's now. It's in my generation. It's coming in this little boy's lifetime. And the fear of the Lord in this instance, realizing that he was not holy and righteous and ready to stand before God, shook him to start walking with the Lord. Two passages I have to read here, and, and you've got to read them with me. Turn there, if you would, to Romans 13, verse 11 through 14. And seeing Paul's attitude, and we're gonna, then we're going to see Peter's attitude of the re revelation that the Lord may be coming back in my time. The New Testament's written to make every single Christian think the Lord's coming back in his time. All of us are Enoch's, if you would. And in Romans 13, verse 11 to 14, And do this knowing the time that now is high time to awake out of sleep, for now your salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is, what? At hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properties in the day, not in rivalry and drunkenness and lewdness, in lust, in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Peter, soberly in, a, in the same way, in 2 Peter chapter 3, if you turn there, it's way back, almost to Revelation, the book of Peter is. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 through 13. 2 Peter chapter 3. Starting in verse 10. But the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away in the great noise and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Verse 11. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for the hastening, the coming of the day of God, because which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Knowing these things are going to be dissolved, in, in Enoch's case, knowing the entire world is going to be destroyed, except one man and his sons who are the lineage of the Messiah. God's bringing judgment on the world and starting over with a new Adam and a new Eve, so to speak. Knowing that everybody on this planet, now you can do the math. There's two different ways of doing it. Some person said if everybody had four children and you do the math, you'd end up around 8 billion people at this time. Another way of saying is looking at it and just say if only half of these people got married, only half of the people that were married had children, and only half of the children could have children, 
you still end up with about 7 billion people at this time. So you're looking at a planet before the flood about the same population as us. And what did the Lord say? As the days of Noah were, so will the planet Earth have devolved, des, de, de-evolved and, what's that? No, devolved, devolved and kept devolving until it became like it was in the time of Enoch and Methuselah. Wow, we're seeing it, aren't we? The days will be like the days of Lot and his righteous soul was vexed every day. So were we in these days. And so we, we see it was sort of a ridiculous amount of time that Thuzo lives. Why? Because it tells us in, in Peter, the last days, mockers will say, the Lord's never going to come. Things are always the same as they've been from creation. Interesting, the mockers still believed in creation. And then he says, hey, understand, God doesn't look at time as you do. To the day the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. But God's not slow concerning his promises. But understand, to put the brakes fully on and to come to a stop and to put the period at the end of the sentence means judgment. And God does not wish for judgment to come upon man. Jesus did not come in this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God does not rejoice in the death of the wicked. People often think that, man, God is up there. He just loves to find you being wrong so he can slap you. God just loves it when people are bad because now it's like, woohoo, I got some good judgment to do. And it's the entire Bible reveals God to be the opposite. He does not want to judge. He does not want to condemn. He does not want even the wickedest of the most wicked to be judged are condemned. He doesn't want that. And so he delays and he delays and tell, it's like, oh my goodness, this guy's lived longer than anybody that's ever lived because God's grace is holding, holding, holding that somebody would repent. Well, in finishing up this chapter back in Genesis 5, verse 28, so Lamech lived 182 years and he had a son and he called his name Noah. Now, If you do the math, here's the crazy thing. Lamech, Noah's dad, would still be alive when Adam was alive. Isn't that crazy? And Noah's kids, of course, were around with grandpa. So Noah's kids, and of course Noah himself, could talk to Lamech and say, Tell us about Adam and Eve. (laughs) Tell us about... And they're getting the message right from the horse's mouth. And here at this time, they have the genealogy written by Adam. And no doubt that was given to Noah to take on the ark with him. And later Moses would get those documents. And uh, so it's, it's pretty radical. And when you realize, you know, interesting, here's another little interesting note. One of the third son of Noah, Shem, was alive when Abraham was born. Because they're living so long, it's interesting that some of these people could talk to people that were around during some significant time. So Abraham, he would have been a baby or a little boy. He could have talked to Shem about what was it like being on the ark. Tell me about the flood. That's pretty astounding when you understand the significance of the length of life these guys had. Well, he called him Noah. This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. These guys, the earth was not being blessed under the blessings of God at this time. And in the midst of of such a harsh, evil time, rest is coming. Noah means comfort or rest. So after he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years and he had sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years and he died. And Noah was 500 years old 
And Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so then we're going to see that Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. And then um, he was 950 years old when he died. Now, some like to try to allegorize these names. In other words, they say, you know, Adam means man and Seth means appointed and Enosh means mortal and Kenan. Have you seen this where they do that? I do not like that. That and numerology, both of them, I, I think, will give you a, you know, they're saying mystically there's, a, there's, there's something written under the, the level. If you look down another level, you'll find a, the real deep meaning, you know. When you look at church history, when you have an, a guy that starts allegorizing, you always end up in dark periods of time following that. Because you eventually make the Bible say whatever you want it to mean. So names in the Bible are important when God tells you the names are important. When God tells you, hey, this guy's name is this and this is why, because his name means it, then you go, okay, that's important. But to go start looking what every single name means and then just try to string them together in the genealogies, uh, interesting, but I, I, do not, I do not think that is a wise way. Just like numerology, you know. Um, you take all the numbers and you put them together and this number in the, in the Hebrew means this and that number means this and you put all the letters together and, um, you know, it says by lotto number, da, 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 you know, whatever. Um, it can get pretty strange. I, I'm not into that whatsoever. Well, next week it takes us into Noah and we'll look at the Lord bringing us into a time of judgment. So is there any questions anybody has here? Yes, Anna. Brian, this might kind of be an apologetics question, but I know that polygamy was never a design or endorsed by the Lord to populate the earth, but it seems like incest was in the beginning. If you want to call it incest, I, I, don't, that's, I don't know what else to call it. So if, you know, we, if, that's like, if that was God's design, his perfect design, you know, God's ways don't change, what was it, or how, how do we explain to people that question that a lot, and that's a big question, that at one point in time, God all of a sudden, okay, uh, no, now, it, now it's not allowed for obvious reasons, medical, you know, health risks, all that. Mm -hmm. Now it's not allowed, but it was his perfect way or design to populate the earth, obviously, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So one seems to be God did endorse, you know, the incest, but obviously not the polygamy. But how do we Christians explain to people that ask us about the early days of Adam and Eve? And yeah. So, the, the, so, you know, why the question is, is, why was it wrong today to marry your sister when it wasn't wrong at this point in Genesis? So as you study through the, the history of Israel, you see various dispensations. And, and God allowed this to happen in this dispensation and did not allow it. A lot of times it was for physical reasons. It was for protective reasons. Um, it wasn't always for spiritual reasons. Like I mentioned, they, they said, hey, bury your poop when you, you know. Um, well, we know that's not a spiritual truth, you know. Man, I feel so closer to God. Why? Because I'm burying all my poop in the backyard. It's not spiritual, even though it says, why? Why do you bury your poop? It says, because God walks amongst you and he is holy. So we understand the significance of that now. So, for example, um, after the flood, they get off the ark. God says, hey, you can start eating the animals. Before that, all the way up to the ark, the entire population of the earth, it appears, was vegetarian. But then after that, God said, why? Because things changed. I think the whole dynamics of the earth changed. And uh, probably the diet that once worked before the flood broke the waters from above and the waters from the was what man could live in, in a certain diet in a certain way. We don't know if man slept two hours a day and was awake all the time or he slept, you know, three days in a row. And it was, we don't know what that... Um, that time before the flood was like. But after the flood, all of a sudden, hey, now man can become carnivorous. It's like, whoa, why was it wrong for the last 1,500 years, but it's okay now? 
you know? Well, it's just a different dispensation. Yep, good question. Any other questions? Okay. Lord, we come before you now, and we thank you for your word, and just ask that you would continue to meld it deeper and deeper and deeper into our hearts. And we know that all of us are to prophesy. You said in 1 Corinthians 14, pray that you might prophesy. Lord, we ask that we would all prophesy, God. We pray that we would all be Enoch's in our day and age, Lord. That we would rejoice your heart. You warned us all, Lord. You said, when you see those days coming, you see the signs of the time, pray, watch, and pray, and be ready. Don't get drunk and caught up in the cares of life, the deceitfulness of riches and other things. Let your heart be steadfast, seeking the Lord. When the Lord returns, will he find faith on this earth? People crying out to him day and night. Lord, we're here. And we're saying, Lord, what do you have for us? What do you have for this fellowship, this church, Lord? Lord.